Today is a night of fantastic designs in nature. There's some really interesting things in nature that uh, I believe God has done, and uh, they're just so mind blowing for me anyway. And so I just like to share things that uh, blow my mind. <laughs> Here we go. To start off with, just so you understand why things blow my mind, I'd like to start off with a quiz. Uh, Usually happens in school, you know, the teacher does a pop quiz just to see where his students are at. So let's just start off here. Here's a picture of some rocks. Um, some of them look natural, some of them maybe look designed. And I just want to know if you know the difference. Um, can you tell which ones are designed? Like that top right hand corner one, is that designed or natural? <laughs> natural. Right. What about the center one? Designed or natural or maybe in between? Don't know for sure. What about the bottom right hand corner of that cube there, granite cube? That's design. Uh, and the bottom center one, that sphere, pretty clearly designed. And some of the uh, other ones are maybe more in between. Right? Well, you're all wrong. <laughs> well, all those rocks are designed. And the top right one is uh, made by a company that makes rocks that look natural for your ground. So, what about this now? It's a little different. We had a snowflake and we got a salt crystal, a pyrite crystal. Now these things are produced naturally. Yet they have the same, they have geometry to them, very similar geometry uh, to things that might otherwise look designed for a different stuff. And uh, just just for a little extra bonus, like the snowflake, there's some really fascinating snowflakes. Like that is a snowflake, understanding micrograph. Uh, looks pretty, here's another snowflake that uh, looks like something that will, <laughs> someone might carve, right? Here's another snowflake. Mm -hmm. Interesting, huh? you don't think of snowflakes being other shapes like that, but that's a snowflake, understand it. Are you sure? That's a real snowflake. Yeah, that's a real snowflake. It certainly looks uh, bizarre, though, like it was carved, right? But that's a real snowflake. How about this? Uh, is this a design or natural? This is design. How do you know that? You have experience growing gardens, and they just don't do that by themselves. How about this? Design or natural? Design. You don't believe that a tornado went through a cornfield and made that? What's wrong with you? How about this is designed or natural? This is natural? It's not. It's, it's designed because it says planting the natural garden. <laughs> and how about, about this? You don't believe a tornado picked all those trees up and shoved them in the beach like that there anymore? It's, it's designed. And uh, you don't believe an earthquake uh, jumbled up those rocks and Stonehenge and they just landed on them. So let's see if there's other similar things in nature that we can tell the difference. One is called the entropic principle. It's where the universe is finely tuned so that life can exist in the universe. And there's a lot of fine tuned features in the universe. Um, it's kind of based on a hypothesis, again, from the Bible. I don't like to do this because people say the Bible is not scientific. It uh, only tells that God did it, doesn't say how he did it. But the Bible does say how he did it. And uh, there are certain scientific statements that can be tested. In Psalms, David says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. So no one, according to David, can ignore this stuff. So it's nice to say, it's easy to say, but is David right? It, and can it be tested? And it can be tested. Back in 1974, Brandon Carter from Cambridge University, he started noticing certain special things about the universe. He said, the universe is a very delicate, balanced place regarding at least 38 precisely interacting features without which no life could exist. By 2001, astronomers had identified more than 150 finely tuned features of the universe needed for complex life to exist. So a few examples of this. The speed of expansion. 
Everything in the universe, all the stars, all the planets, everything is flying away from each other. And they're flying away from each other at a very precise speed. And if that speed was just a slightly bit of fraction bigger than one part of 10 to the power of 123, and to understand that number, that's a tiny little fraction of the number, but the 10 to the 123 is an enormous number. Uh, there's only 10 to the 80th atoms in the entire visible universe, for example. And uh, so that's an enormous, and that's the universe as a universe of the universe. It's just an incredible number. So if you were just off by one part in 10 to the 123, slightly one more or one less, let's say it's one more, the universe would expand too fast so the complex life could not exist. Uh, star systems and planets could not form properly. And if it went too slow, the whole universe would crunch back on itself and uh, we could not exist. So it's very interesting. And so the odds of this the precision is like uh, picking a, uh, the right grain of sand out of the Sahara Desert, blindfolded, five times in a row. So uh, what are the odds, right? So here's another one. Uh, atomic charges are perfectly balanced inside the atom. The electron, the negative electron, is exactly the same charge, negative versus positive, as the proton. To the same degree, even though the proton is bigger, a lot bigger than the electron, and everything else is different. Size, weight, magnetic properties, everything else is different. But the charge is exactly the same in degree. And if that was just slightly off, um, complex molecules could not exist in the universe. And also, if uh, the mass of the proton versus electron were just a little bit different, the mass difference right now is 1,836 times the proton more mass than the electron. If that were slightly different, again, complex molecules could not exist. So does anyone get it? Now, there's hundreds of these, right? I could just go on and on all night. Does anybody else get this? Lots of scientists get it, especially physicists. Now, I've always thought physicists were smarter than biologists, same but uh, Sir Roger Penrose, he was one of the first to voice the obvious conclusion, philosophical so, The extremely high level of fine-tuning astronomers and physicists are powerfully suggest purpose to so, And uh, he wrote that in the Brief History of Time. Uh, Sir Frederick Coyle, he came up with the phrase Big Bang. You know, he didn't believe in the Big Bang, so he uh, tried to make a derogatory statement. He said, oh, you guys believe in the Big Bang? But then it stuck. That's the Big Bang. He says, such properties seem to run through the fabric of the natural world like a thread of happy coincidences, which he believed in 1951 that there were current coincidences. But by 1953, so many had been discovered that he changed his mind. He says, but there's so many odd coincidences essential to life that some explanation seems required to account for them. A super intellect has monkey with physics as well as chemistry and biology. So Australian astrophysicist Paul Davies, he says, such a stunning accuracy in the precisely balanced universe needed to support complex life is surely one of the great mysteries of cosmology. The belief that there is something behind it all is one that I personally share with, I suspect, a majority of physicists. Uh, that's not true for biologists, right? You know, most biologists are agnostic or atheist, but not physicists. There must be a God who is responsible for these laws and responsible for the universe. Now, Paul Davies is somewhat conflicted. He goes back and forth between agnosticism and, and some sort of belief, theism. But right now, I think he's back at agnosticism, so it's confusing to me. But every now and then, something else pops into his head, and he's back to theism. So, Nobel laureate Ronald Penzias, he says, astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which, which was created out of nothing and delicately balanced to provide exactly the conditions required to support life. It's like a Goldilocks universe, you know. It's not too hot, it's not too cold. And in the absence of an absurdly improbable accident, the observations of modern science seem to suggest an underlying, one might say, a supernatural plan. And Freeman Dyson, I mean, we could go on and on. Um, mathematical physicists, as we look out into the universe and identify the many accidents of physics and astronomy that have worked out to our benefit, it almost seems as if the universe, in some sense, must have known that we were coming. He uses a lot of, like, edgy words, you know, almost, maybe, perhaps, yeah. right? But, uh, and 
disturbing, he wrote that in Disturbing the Universe. But you know, he kind of feels, he's not entirely comfortable with this conclusion, but he kind of feels forced into the conclusion because of what he's seeing. Owen Gingrich, uh, astronomy at uh, Harvard, he says, to me, belief in a final cause, a creator God, gives coherent understanding of why the universe seems so congenially designed for the existence of intelligent, self-reflective life. It would take only small changes in numerous physical constants to render the universe uninhabitable. Somehow, in the words of Freeman Dyson, the guy we just read, this is a universe that knew we were coming. And he makes a more definitive conclusion. He says, God's universe. Right? He wrote this in God's universe. However, not everybody agrees. Uh, Bernard Carr, he's a cosmologist at um, Queen Mary University in London. He's, he's an atheist. He writes, if there is only one universe, you might have to have a fine tuner. If you don't want God, you better have a multiverse. In other words, uh, not because of science, because science can't detect these things, but he believes that there are trillions and gazillions and almost an infinite number of universes out there, and ours is just one of them that just happened to get lucky. And uh, the odds have improved for him because, you know, chances are if there's enough universes, one of them is bound to get lucky and it might as well be ours. Right? Well, by, by that argument, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor of California, right, for a while. And uh, let's say that he happened to win the California lottery ten times in a row. And, uh, well, you know, he may just be in the right universe, right? <laughs> so, Anything that happens uh, well, just could be in the right universe. It's, it undermines science itself. Everything can be explained by that uh, statement. Anything that happens, whether a chance or not chance, you go to Las Vegas. Uh, I happen to uh, decide to play the roulette wheel, and I win a hundred times in a row. And, and the the guys and the cameras, you know, they come back and they the big fellows and they grab me on both sides and they escort me to the door and say, "You are no longer welcome." Vegas. And I was like, what? Well, I was just in the right universe. Yeah, what's wrong with you guys? Right? See, it undermines any kind of statistical odds or analysis. It's anti-science, this conclusion, this argument. And I'm not the only one who says this. There's uh, Charles Hart Towns. He says, I'm talking about this argument, he says, this is a very special universe. It's remarkable that it came out just this way. If the laws of physics weren't just the way they are, we couldn't be here at all. Some scientists argue that, well, there's an enormous number of universes, and each one is just a little different, and this one just happened to turn out right. Well, that's a postulate, and it's a pretty fantastic postulate. It assumes that there really are enormous numbers of universes, and that the laws could be different for each one. The other possibility is that Mars was planned, and that is why it came out so specially. So, which one makes more rational sense? even more scientific sense. Here's another guy. He's uh, Leonard Susskind, the theoretical physicist, um, and he talks about this concept. As the general view of this for most physicists is that these fine tunings are largely accidental, uh, that the constants of nature are determined by some mathematical principles which have nothing whatever to do with our existence. Impersonal, mathematical, and uh, we were just incredibly lucky that that mathematics happened to give, happened to give rise to a universe with all this kind of fine tuning. For a while, it was so. possible to believe that the laws of nature were not so precisely set as to require the hand of a creator. But then a completely new fundamental property of the universe was discovered. An anti-gravity force present in space itself. It is called the cosmological constant. And when cosmologists calculated its effect on the evolution of the universe, they realized it had to be very finely tuned indeed. The fine tunings, how fine, how fine tuned are they? Most of them are 1% sort of things. In other words, if a thing is 1% uh, different, uh, everything is bad. And a physicist could say, maybe those are just luck. On the other hand, this cosmological constant is tuned to one part and 10 to the 120, 120 decimal places. Nobody thinks that's accidental. That is not a reasonable idea, that something is tuned to 120 decimal places just by accident. 
That's the most extreme example of fine-tuning. No force in the history of cosmology has ever been discovered to be that finely tuned. The cosmological constant needs to be set to one part in a trillion, 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 that the cosmological constant arrived at such a tiny value by chance seemed to be out of the question. But the alternative explanation was also impossible to contemplate. Physicists uh, did not want to accept the idea that the laws of nature might be controlled by, uh, by well, the benevolence of nature. There should be no reason why the luck should just have it that we can exist. It's too much, it's, it's a stretch, it's much too far to stretch. It seemed that hidden in the laws of nature was a value so precise that it was impossible to deny that our universe was designed. But a designed universe requires the existence of a designer, a notion that even the anthropic scientists did not want to entertain. So they didn't want to entertain it, but they kind of have to entertain it, you know, so they're conflicted. But uh, for us, we don't have to be so conflicted, right? So, uh, besides the universe, there's something greater, and it's life. Life is more complex. Even the simplest living thing is more complex than the entire universe. And uh, these little things that fit in the palm of your hand are incredibly complicated. Um, and like David said, uh, I, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are marvelous. I know that full well. Um, did David know that full well? Well, he knew it pretty well. I mean, but we know it even fuller or water <laughs> today. By the way, I had to cut off David. Um, Sigrid forced me to cut off David at a strategic spot. But uh, if you want to see the full thing, you have to go look it up for yourself. So, uh, but I view life as especially uh, the process of forming uh, a human life as God's giant origami project. It's, it's amazingly complicated. Embryogenesis is amazingly complicated. You start out with a flat sheet of cells and they get folded and folded and folded and folded and folded and then out finally comes a baby. It's just incredible how it all works and every cell knows where to go. It's all programmed how to do that. And, and I just have to do a little promotion of my own. <laughs> so, but it's all based on this code, a DNA code, four letters. And that sequence of that code in every one of our cells tells those cells what to do, and just when to do it. It's just incredible. Um, but there's some people who don't see the uh, mystery or the incredible design of it. They still want to explain fantastic things using mindless processes, mindless nature, um, like the human eye. The human eye is fantastically complex, incredibly beautiful and uh, elegant in its design. But Richard Dawkins says no. He says uh, there's flaws. There's uh, key flaws that no intelligent designer would have done if he had made the eye by intelligence. For example, the, there's a verted retina, like squid and octopus and other creatures have a verted retina, where the rods and cones are pointed toward the light. They're pointed front ways, and uh, when the light comes in, it hits them straight away. And the nerve goes off behind it. Right? That's the proper way things should be done, according to Richard Dawkins. Our eyes, on the other hand, and birds and, and uh, other types of creatures, we have an inverted retina, where the rods and cones point away from the light, and the nerves comes out the backside, and all the light has to go through the nerves, through the wiring, to get to the rods and cones to activate them. And that just seems completely irrational mm -hmm. to Richard Dawkins, right? It doesn't make any sense that the things would be pointed backwards, unless it was done by random chance, by some sort of mindless process. But is there any rational reason why they should be pointed backwards? Well, let's look at Dawkins' argument. He says, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point toward the light with their wires leading backwards toward the brain. Doing it the opposite way would offend any tiny-minded engineer. Right? 
right? So who in their right mind would have done it the wrong way, right? Well, let me tell you, there's an advantage. There's lots of advantages to the inverted retina. Um, it allows for greater visual acuity and image processing power. All the best imaging systems that we know of, birds and humans and anything that has very good high precision vision has an inverted retina. Those things that don't have an inverted retina, they have kind of, uh, they don't function very well when it comes to precision, only with rapid movement up and down, sideways, things like that. But when you need high precision, you need an inverted retina. Uh, for example, uh, a few details. The cost, the cost for energy cost to maintain the retina is enormous for the human body. Uh, it uses 300% more energy than the brain's cortex, 50% more energy than the renal cortex, and 600% more energy than the heart. So it takes a lot of energy to maintain this high vision system that we have. Um, also, the inverted retina allows the rods and cones to be closer to the blood vessels to resupply it with this energy that it needs. If they were pointed away, it would be harder to transport that energy to them from the blood vessels. So they're transported and they're poked in right next to the blood vessels so they can get the energy really quick that they need. Also, the core, the, there's a pigmented layer right above the vascular layer, and they're poked into this pigmented layer so that when the photons come in, they don't bounce around and set them all off. So the, the black pigment re reabsorbs the photons, and so you get higher visual acuity that way. If you're pointed the other direction, you can't do that. Also, if you were pointed the other direction, and the, you know the tips of the rods and cones, they have these discs, and they shed them off as they become used. Like, you know, the, the old flash cameras? Not uh, flash, you throw them away, right? And new cameras don't do, do that, but it's kind of like the old flash camera. You use one, and it, and it gets discarded. If you had it pointed away, uh, from the retina, it would discard right in front of your field of vision. And pretty soon your field of vision would get foggy. And so if you turn around and point it in toward the vessels, they discard toward the vessels and they can get processed that way and sent down the bloodstream and then reprocessed. Much easier that way. And so you don't avoid foggy vision. And um, we already talked about the black, black, black pigment and there's a bunch of other things, but uh, one, one key thing that was uh, fairly recently discovered, 2007, is these Mueller glial cells. You know, D Dar um, Dawkins was all upset that the light had to travel through the wires, through the nerves, new nerve wires, right? And it would mess things up, and no tidy-minded engineer would do that. Well, these Mueller cells, interestingly enough, they catch the light on one end, and they fiber optically transmit the light to the retinal cells, to the light receptors. And so there's no disturbance with the uh, wires because they go right through them through these fiber optic uh, transmissions. And uh, of course, Richard Dawkins didn't know that at the time. But you know, it's like to me, it's like a six-year-old trying to tell the designer of a skyscraper that he's doing things wrong. Because it's like, well, until you can do better, uh, have at it, right? Uh, who are you to talk to me about doing things wrong? What do you know? Until you can design an eye. Uh, to function better than it already does. What room do you have to talk? You're just like an ignorant, uh, arrogant person doing that who has no clue. Uh, beyond that, uh, further discoveries just make it more and more sense as far as why the eye is designed like it is. Um, metamorphosis is a very interesting process. So that animals, uh, lots of different animals can metamorph from one type to another. Butterfly is the most probably the most famous example. It starts out as a caterpillar, and then all of a sudden it decides it needs to uh, build a cocoon around itself and transform itself into a butterfly. Um, the process, though, is entirely non-intuitive from a Darwinian perspective. What happens is the caterpillars are crawling along all happy as a clam, munching along on the leaves, doing just fine, enjoying himself, getting all fat and chubby, and then all of a sudden, one day, these cells inside the caterpillar, they're called imaginal cells. They're not imaginary cells. They're called imaginal cells. These imaginal cells, all of a sudden, they decide they want to replicate. And they replicate, and they start uh, secreting enzymes, and they digest the caterpillar from the inside. They, they liquefy the caterpillar. And of course, the caterpillar does not like the liquefaction process. And so the caterpillar mounts a vicious immune attack against the imaginal cells. 
but the imaginal cells defend themselves and they're successful and they're victorious and they succeed in liquefying the caterpillar. And so the caterpillar, all the parts of the caterpillar are completely destroyed by these imaginal cells. And the imaginal cells, they, they use the juices of the liquefied caterpillar and they grow and they grow based on these juices and they produce all the parts of the, um, of the butterfly. Uh, and there's they're two completely different creatures. None of the parts for the caterpillar survive. And all the parts for the butterfly are unique to the butterfly. They're two completely different creatures. And uh, how do you do that by natural selection slowly? Because this all happens, how do you select this bit of goo from that bit of goo when it's all in a cocoon and there's no survival advantage or anything like that? It's and embryogenesis itself is a, is a form of embryogenesis. And it's very hard to explain natural selection, how nature can select mindlessly the different steps, the millions of different steps that are required to get from a caterpillar to a butterfly. It's just mind-boggling for me how anybody could believe that could be explained mindlessly. Here, for example, this is the caterpillar. And right at the tip there, that's the spinneret. The caterpillar has to be very good, and for some reason educated very well on how to spin its cocoon. It's not a simple process. It has to spin the silk thread and it has to spin it just right. And to show you, you know, it has to first of all climb up, make a little attachment, and then form this cocoon around itself and spin it just so. And how does it do that? It has crochet books on the tip of that spinneret. And it knows how to crochet uh, all these uh, silk. And uh, Here's the, the higher power view of those crochet hooks and how they're all wrapped around it. And it crochets a little blanket around itself with these little hooks. And uh, here's another picture of that. And, and that, how is that explained by natural selection? How, how, let's say you start out with kind of something that sort of looks like maybe a hook, but you also have to have a silk at the same time. And how do you hook it up and properly spin it around yourself? If you spin it around too loosely, it's your, you turn to sludge, and your sludge just seeps, seeps out the whole earth, right? You have to spin it perfectly. Your sludge is not going to stay in the pocket, right? How do you do that slowly? If you do it wrong one time, you're done. Oh, game over. No offspring over. No, no more natural selection. It has to be done perfectly the first time. Uh, here's uh, the butter, and I'm, part of this illustration is say these two different creatures are complex in their own right. That spinneret is for the caterpillar. The butterfly doesn't have spinnerets like this. The caterpillar does, and it's very complicated. But the butterfly has other complicated things that are entirely unique to the butterfly, like uh, the wings of the butterfly. You know that butterflies have all kinds of brilliant colors. They're kind of iridescent, all kinds of spectacular colors. You know what, those are not based on pigment. They're based on crystalline refraction of light. Mm -hmm. They're not based on, on any sort of kind of standard pigment. All the different colors are based on just one thing, chitin, the external body skeleton of, of insects. The same material makes the different color, all the different colors for all butterflies. And it's just a matter of how it's arranged. And how it's arranged is, I'm going higher power, higher and higher power on the wing of the butterfly. And so here's a blue butterfly, but that's not a pigment. It's, uh, we're getting closer, electron micrograph. And here you get these stacks along the wing of these little uh, crystalline things. And the chitin looks, and now, now you can see the color to it. And here we get a little closer, and it's called butterfly gyroids. And the, these gyroids uh, look like geometric structures made out of chitin, and depending on the different geometry, you get different colors. And here's, they're kind of beautiful, I think. But, uh, and how, how do you make these sort of geometric structures slowly uh, to make any sort of color that's attractive uh, and, and in a stepwise natural selection manner? I don't know, it just blows my mind. I can't imagine how that could be done slowly versus why can't you just use a regular pigment? Uh, to do it, but no, these are crystalline sort of, uh, it diffracts light to make kind of a rainbow. And depending on the different type of gyroid, you get a different spectrum of the rainbow that, that shines through. And that's why it kind of looks iridescent and sort of metallic uh, to it, 
because they're these little gyroids. And I think they're just spectacular. Uh, the feather of a bird, very interesting. And I don't understand how it could evolve slowly either. It's based, you know, Velcro. Velcro is copied from this. The bird feather is based on hooks and grooves. Where, and then the, the bird kind of preens itself. What the bird is doing is hooking up all those hooks with the grooves again. Now this is zip, and then unzip, and zip. This is just like what Velcro does. And uh, how do you do that slowly? How do you make the hooks properly line up and then attach themselves just right to the groove that just happens to be there, just at the right spot for it to line up, so the things can stick together? And uh, here's just some pictures of how they, they line up and stick together and hold each other in place. The hooks and the grooves. And, um, and you know, the, the evolutionary theory just blows my mind. You know, these hooks and grooves, they're supposed to evolve from the scales, specialized scales. And how do you take a scale that looks like a snake scale or a lizard scale? Because birds are supposed to evolve from lizards or from reptiles. And you take a scale that's just a basic plain thing like that, and you have to stretch it out, turn it into hooks and grooves, and, and make them stick together just right by natural selection, random mutation, mindlessly. How do you do that over time uh, by random chance? I just don't understand uh, how that could be done. Uh, woodpecker, very interesting. You know, uh, a woodpecker is a very finely tuned creature. It pecks at 22 beats a second. 22 beats a second. You know, I can't even do it fast enough. <laughs> Try yourself. And it pecks so hard, it puts 20, uh, 1,200 genes on its little head. 1,200 times the force of gravity on its little head every time it goes in there. Bam, bam, bam. It's like, it's like a bullet hitting the tree. And uh, it hits so hard that it has to be very precise on how it pecks. Because if it's just a little bit tilted and it pecks just at the wrong angle, its whole head will fly apart. It'll just go... Right? And so what it has to do, every time it pulls back its head, it has to open its eyes, readjust, and go back in and, just, and close its eyes as it goes back in. Because if it doesn't close its eyes as it goes back in, first of all, it'll get hit by a little debris coming out. Second of all, its eyes will fly out. That those are called wondering cheese. So it has to close its eyes and keep them in its head. And then, and then readjust again or else its whole head will fly. And it does that 22 times a second. Don't open close, open close. I mean, I can't even open my eyes and close it twice a second. Right? But that's what it does. And so you have to imagine, and also the tongue. The tongue starts out here, goes backwards, all around its head, back around the top, and then back down through its mouth. And it has a little barb on it, because the tongue has to be long enough to reach down in that hole and grab the one and pull it out. Right? So, I mean, the first woodpecker, evolutionary speaking, let's say there was an evolutionist tree, the very first woodpecker, it decides it's going to try. Here's a little bug in that tree. Oh, I want that bug. It sounds very juicy, right? So he starts pecking away. Peck, peck, peck. But he's not pecking very hard because he's the first woodpecker and just doesn't know how, right? And so he's pecking as best as he can. But he's making maybe a millimeter of headway a minute, right? And in the meantime, the bug says, What's pecking on my tree? Right? So the bug crawls away, right? So the woodpecker can't get to him. It's like, it's all or nothing here, folks. You know, either you peck really hard and blow your head to bits <laughs> because you don't know how to adjust and open and close your eyes properly, or the little worm escapes. Right? Uh, how do you do this slowly? It just doesn't make any sense to me. So here's another one: bombardier beetle. Fascinating little bug. If you and it's very accurate. If you press on one of those little legs, he swings his little. He's got a, a kind of a tail rider sort of, uh, I don't know how it does it, but you can swing it at 270 different degrees. And so any little leg you press on, or any angle you come at him on, he can aim that little thing around and zap you. And he zaps you with explosions. Uh, these things blow up, and it goes bam, 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 and, it, and he makes multiple explosions, and they're very hot at 270 degrees, uh, that it blows up at and it smells horrible. And so then anything with its right mind still there, uh, we're well away. Right? So here's how it does it. It's got, uh, it's got two different sacs. One of them makes hydrogen peroxide at 28%, uh, very, pretty concentrated. And the other one makes hydroquinone 
And then when it decides to zap something, it mixes these two chemicals together and they explode. <laughs> and uh, so, and they explode at uh, 212 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. It's again a horrible smell. And uh, makes a burning, steamy, poppy noise. And uh, again, the, the twin cannons and all uh, that it does this with. So let me ask you from an evolutionary perspective, you got the beetle and, and he's, He's got these two chemicals, but he, he doesn't have the two compartments set up yet, so he mixes them a little too early and bam, no more <laughs> right? so, uh, so he's like, well, you know, I've I got to tell my cousins that they have to modify it. So he's gone. You know, there's no telling anybody about how to do this. So how does this happen slowly? You know, you've got these two very dangerous chemicals. You know, hydrogen peroxide is rocket fuel. Right, that's what's used for, to, and he's a little, this is a kind of type of rocket system. You've got the two mixing components and the cylinders, and it goes in and it blows up and propels it. It's a rocket sort of system. How do you do that slowly without destroying the beetle if it screws up just once? You know, you screw up at all, and no more beetle. No more offspring, no survival of the fittest. Right? So, uh, DNA transcription. How do you copy DNA? Or, I'm sorry, I had to transcribe it into a, a messenger RNA. And there's a little neat little machine that does this. And uh, how, again, how do you do this slowly? Every, every, every living thing has this, even the single cell organism, everything has to have this that has DNA. If you don't have this, you can't tell anything else what to do because you can't uh, interpret your DNA. DNA would be worthless without this little machine. So which came first, the DNA or this little machine? Start walking down the microtubules and as they walk away, 
Then they get pulled apart. Then the chromosomes get pulled apart. They have these little legs, they look like little animals. Okay, they walk along. Just incredible. Uh, that's in every single one. That's in every organism that does this. Here's inside a blood vessel. Here's a macrophage. It decides it's going to go along looking for some infection in it. It senses the membrane as it goes along to uh, send signals for how it should move. Here's the external cytoskeleton for the cell. Proteins floating along like islands. Now we're flying in through the into the middle of the cell through the through the skeleton of the cell. And inside the cell, there's an internal skeleton made of these little fibers. And as they get to the proper length, if they need to be trimmed, other proteins come along and trim them just at the right spot so that they have to be at the right length. Clip. A little hair cut. Microtubules the same way. Let's say it needs to move. It needs to move along from one way to the other. Well, it forms on one end and dissolves on the other end at just the right speed so it can crawl along. Here's these other little machines that have these little feet that pull, they're like the truck transport for the cell. They pull along these vesicles filled with proteins from one place to another along these microtubules and they walk them from one place to another. And here's this uh, centriole that has its own DNA, very complicated. That's how that is part of the uh, division process of the cell. Here's the messenger RNA that spit out through the nuclear pores. And then those other little proteins I showed you earlier, they come along and they uh, they decode the messenger RNA and the proteins, and then the proteins get put into these uh, tubes, and then they tear off, and the proteins inside those little bugs get transported to those little walking feet to these other structures called Golgi, where the proteins get modified, because the proteins, when they're first made, are not functionally active. So they have to get modified by the Golgi apparatus. So they get transported on one side, and then they butt off on the other, and gets exported from the surface of the cell, because these uh, things get transported out there. And then the macrophages signal, hey, here's an infection, come in here and help us fight this bacteria or whatever it is. And so it slips through the endothelial cells to go off and fight the infection. And is it evolution life? <laughs> here's a sperm head. It is very complicated, like a little um, torpedo. It's got multiple layers to it to protect the DNA. And then it fertilizes the egg, and then the egg starts dividing two, four, eight, sixteen, so on. And finally, it forms a little ball, and then inside the ball, it forms a hollow structure. And inside the hollow structure, it forms a flat sheet of cells that I told you about earlier. And then these flat sheet of cells, like a piece of paper, they're divided down the middle by another structure. It ends up forming the nerve cord and the spinal cord. But then. As this thing is divided down the middle, then these cells start folding upon themselves. They fold and fold and fold. And they start forming different systems, uh, including the brain at the top, and then the eye structure, and the little arms and legs start fold forming around the central line. And it just turns into a baby. It's just amazing. It's incredibly interesting. Study a simple embryology of course and your book is very thick. You know, it's not very easy to explain. So what's the meaning of this? Here's a little cartoon to uh, illustrate the meaning. Let me get some volume here. Hello, I'm Creation. And I am the theory of evolution. Why, why are you so happy? Oh, are you kidding? Because I have hope. Hope? Mm-hmm. You know, in the assurance that I have a purpose. A purpose? Mm-hmm. You can have one too, you know. I don't want one. <laughs> what are you talking about? Everybody wants to have a purpose. That's not true. Some people want to hold to the unproven fact that we're nothing more than a bunch of protoplasmic goo that evolved over billions of years and will end up as cosmic garbage, therefore serving no one or no purpose at all. No hope or purpose? Right. That's so sad. So, so sad. So anyway, I think that uh, the evidence is there. I think it's overwhelming as far as what I've been able to uh, discover about design and nature and living things. I think it's spectacular. I think it's very hopeful. There's a lot of evil in the world, but uh, there's also some beauty left over. Not everything from the Garden of Eden has been wiped out by sin yet. And uh, so God still... You know, we, we, can, we can stare at the thorns and complain all day long, or we can choose to look at the roses, right? So the choice is up to you. 
there's certainly evil, evil in the world, but there's also good in the world, and there's evidence, I, I believe, that God loves us. And that he died to save us, and he's going to make it make it all better, like it's supposed to be originally someday. So, if you have any questions, uh, feel free. I'm usually my favorite book. So, <laughs> yes? You know what's amazing is that it looks like its own miniature universe in one cell. Yeah. You know, yes. micro things, so I, how complex that is. A single cell is way more complex than New York City or anything like that. It's got its own hubs, it's got its own traffic, it's got... And we think nothing of it. Right. We got signs of it. What's the big deal? Right. So, anyway. If there's no other questions, I hope you all were uh, blown away as much as I was finding these things. And appreciate you.